So, hello everybody. Very nice to see you all here. Um, I start in Estonian and then switch to English. Tere kõigele, tere tulemast Eesti Rahva Muuseumi teadusseminari. Sel korral on meil teadusseminari inglise keeles, selleks on väga hea põhjus, sest meil on kaks teadlast külas Helsinki ülikoolist, Heidi Henriika Mäkela ja Liisa Kunnas ja nende pealkiri ettekande pealkirja on Vibing the Furthest Fast. Ja nüüd ma lähen inglis keele peale üle. Welcome to our research seminar. We have two guests from University of Helsinki, Heidi Henriika Mäkela and Liisa Kunnas. And their presentation explores the contemporary exhibition of prehistory at the National Museum of Finland. And uh, Heidi Henrika Mäkela is a uh, university research of folklore studies at the University of Helsinki. And she specializes in the production of Finnishness and Finnish speciality in contemporary Finland in relation to Kalavala metric oral, oral poetry and intangible cultural heritage. And uh, Lisa Kunas uh, is a PhD researcher at uh, the University of Helsinki. And she is currently finalizing her doctoral dissertation in archaeology about the history of Stone Age research in Finland. But the floor is yours, please, Heidi. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak here in this research seminar. Uh, as Tenno already mentioned, I am Heidi Henrika Mäkelä. I'm a folklorist and a university researcher at the University of Helsinki. And lately I have studied the uh, uh, contemporary discussions on Kalevala metric poetry in Finland from various perspectives. Lisa, would you like to say something about yourself? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I'm joining you. Uh, here via teams from Helsinki and I'm Lisa Kunnas, I'm archaeologist and I'm hoping to get my PhD dissertation ready uh, at the end of this year maybe or in the next spring at the latest. Uh, this presentation today is based on our cooperation. Uh, we have done field work at the National Museum of Finland and we, we have been especially interested in how folklore and uh, Finnic mythology is utilized uh, in the exhibition of prehistory at the National Museum of Finland. And we are also interested in, in multi-sensory tools and, and these kinds of perspective related to this theme. Our presentation today uh, is structured in a following way. First, we will provide you an introduction, a short introduction to uh, this theme. We will uh, uh, say something about the National Museum of Finland and the exhibition of prehistory. And, and then we will discuss the background of, of this presentation. We will discuss uh, the uh, archaeology, fields of archaeology and folklore studies and how they intertwine in many ways. And then I will talk about the so-called ideal of Kalevalaicity uh, that is a fundamental way to understand the Finnish past in, in conte contemporary Finland. And then we will uh, shortly analyze the contemporary exhibition of prehistory and, and the mythical knowledge used in that uh, exhibition. And uh, we will discuss uh, the exhibition or, and, and, and folklore as a gap filler in archaeological knowledge and, and then we will also uh, examine a little bit how folklore uh, and materiality intertwine in, in, through interactive tools at the exhibition. And then we will provide you some concluding remarks. Uh, the National Museum of Finland 
uh, with which you are probably familiar with, but I will just tell you some basic facts about, about it. It was established in 1916, and it's today maintained by the Finnish Heritage Agency. And when the museum was established, the ideals of so-called national sciences, such as Finnish ethnology, folklore, Finnish literature, Finnish history and archaeology, were embedded in the practice and ideology of the institution. And you will see it very soon, very clearly, how uh, this still, uh, these, ideals, these ideals still can be seen at the museum. And similar to other European National Museum project, the National Museum of Finland negotiated at that time when it was established and still negotiates the changes, continuations, differences, unities and disruptions in national identities and represents national values, moves and truths. Uh, and now we have a small YouTube video uh, that's uh, made by the National Museum of Finland and is targeted for international audience and it and uh, and uh, it gives you gives you a little glimpse. The of... National Museum of Finland opened okay. its doors to the public in January 1916, one year before Finland became independent. Although at the time Finland was still part of the Russian Empire, object acquisition was already underway for the collections by the mid 19th century. Finns felt that it was important to show that Finland had its own history and culture. An architecture competition was held in 1902, and a team of architects, Armas Lindgren, Hermann Gazelius, and Elio Saarinen, were declared the winners. They designed every hall in the museum to have a different shape and style in order to allow for each part of the collection to be showcased in a hall which perfectly complemented it. The construction of the building was completed in 1910. The museum building's different parts represent various architectural styles from past centuries with easily recognizable features from a medieval church, a castle, and a Renaissance mansion, among others. Its detailed ornaments depict Finnish flora and fauna, such as pine branches, a hare, and a fox. The main door is guarded by a granite bear, which was carved by sculptor Emil Wikström. The National Museum's building is done in the Art Nouveau style and is considered one of Finland's national romantic jewels. Thanks, that was it. Uh, the exhibition of prehistory was reopened for the public in 2017. Uh, Lisa will tell you uh, later how the, about the processes that led to this, the opening of this new exhibition. Uh, the exhibition represents a prehistory of Finland from the settlement of the current Finnish area for, from the first post-glacial settlement until the end of the Iron Age. And this is how Kansallismuseo, the National Museum of Finland itself describes uh, the exhibition, I quote. The exhibition showcases the most fascinating finds and exciting mysteries from Finland's prehistory. The Wendell era, Levanluhta water burial site, swords, animal motive items, silver treasures and other artifacts tell our story from the end of the Ice Age to the end of the Iron Age. Experience the exhibition with multiple senses. Touch a genuine reindeer axe, bring a cave painting to life and see a mammoth move. The digital exhibits bring history to the present day. The activity and experience-based presentation invites you to immerse yourself in the alternate worlds of the prehistoric era. The exhibition presents no single truth about the past instead of offering alternative interpretations based on the latest archaeological research. The unanswered questions burrow into your mind, arousing a thirst for knowledge. Quote ends. Uh, in the translations, uh, there are some mistakes. Uh, I want to remind you there is no reindeer axe, but a stone axe. And also there are no cave paintings in Finland, but uh, should be uh, rock painting. Uh, but anyway, this uh, introductory text uh, describes very well the nature of the exhibition as it 
focuses on the experience on, and the sensory experience of the visitor. And it also emphasizes this kind of very, uh, uh, very kind of idea that there is no single truth about the past, but it's, it's a con construction and it's built in multiple ways. Now it's Lisa's turn. Thanks. <clears throat> there were already a lot of these things that I uh, put on this slide, uh, touched upon what Heidi said before and also in the in the video. And well, just this history of the building and uh, anything, everything related to it would itself be like a one uh, presentation, but I'll just uh, go through some some major points from the history of the National Museum. So in the 19th century already there was there were these unofficial in initiatives about the National Museum at the university because they had collections of archaeological finds and ethnographic uh, items and uh, arts but they didn't have like rooms for all of, all of that so there was talk that we should get a a national museum of our own in Finland and uh, the idea of the National Museum being also something for all Finno-Ugric peoples and, and a place to display the history and cultures of Finno-Ugric peoples, not just uh, Finns, was very much uh, emphasized during the late 19th century in these talks about founding this museum. Uh, maybe today it's sort of not, not that prominent in the museum anymore, but it was very important uh, in the be in the beginning of the museum I national museum idea, so there were these collections that are today formed. The collections of the national museum came from uh, different places where uh, items like archaeological finds and um, ethnographic items, and then some like pieces of art and also foreign and exotic. Uh, artifacts had been collected to the university and then later in the uh, late 19th century there was the archaeological committee or Muinaistieteellinen toimikunta, the predecessor of the Finnish Heritage Agency and then uh, these collections were put together as a state historical museum and then in the, into that there were still added these uh, collections of the Antiquarian Society and some other like smaller collections. Uh, but how, how the university ended up as, as collecting all the archaeological finds, uh, it was caused by the change in le legislature of cultural heritage or how, what to do with archaeological finds uh, when Finland was ceded from Swedish realm and uh, uh, Came, came part of the Russian Empire because before before that the Swedish uh, legislation for archaeological finds uh, dictated that everything had to be sent to Stockholm. But then when Finland was sort of like cut cut off from the Swedish administrative, uh, Finns just decided to start collecting them by their own and and put the university as the as the like administrator to handle those collections. So there were a lot of these like small collections going around and, and they were kept in different buildings and there was not, not like not like displays or exhibitions for like everyone, but because there were not, not room, room for that kind of uh, thing at the university. And well, we already went through this, these architects and how the building was designed in national romanticist uh, style representing different historical periods. And also the in, inside rooms in the museum, the original exhibition halls were designed so that they would uh, like complement the artifacts that are on, on display so that, for example, medieval church art would be displayed in, in a room that was designed to look like a medieval church also inside the building. Uh, 
and well, it took like 10 years from when the construction began until the museum could be open for the public. And the collections moved in there like in separate uh, batches during that 10 years. And then the um, exhibitions were opened only after, because, well, you know, uh, Finland got independent in 1917 and then we had this nice museum opened, but there were not not all of the exhibitions ready. There was only like ethnography and uh, history. And then in 1918, we had civil war and uh, well, the museum was closed and there were actually German troops uh, living in there during the phase where they uh, took over Helsinki. And there is a bullet hole in the door of the museum still visible from the civil war. Uh, battles going on in Helsinki. So after all this stuff, they uh, only like officially had all the exhibitions ready and the museum opened in 1920. And these uh, famous Kalevala themed frescoes by Axel Galle and Kalle Latara showing this picture were originally painted for a world fair. Is it called world fair? Maybe <laughs> some kind of like, yeah, I think it's world fair. Uh, that that had this Finnish pavilion that was like the also designed by Keselius Lindgren and Saarinen, sort of like a predecessor of this kind of temple for Finnish history and culture. And then the, uh, the first version of these frescoes was uh, on display in there, but then Kalle and Gala painted these uh, like as frescoes are done right, right to the ceiling of the entrance hall of the National Museum. Uh, yeah, okay, we can go to the next slide. Thanks. So the first free history exhibition was uh, on there like for almost 20 years. And it already had like these same same sections that that then were at the exhibition until this this current one. So there was Stone Age and Bronze Age and Iron Age and almost like everything that had been found at that point from Finland was on display. Uh, and then during the war, the museum was closed and the Second World War and all the collections were evacuated uh, to countryside to avoid getting bombed or uh, whatever. And then after the war, uh, a second prehistory display was, was put, uh, exhibition was put on display and uh, that that was then like for a very long time in there. There were some modifications done, but mostly it was the 46 exhibition that, that was there like until the early 1980s. And I'm not sure what was going on in there. I tried to do some research on this, but it seems that people <laughs> couldn't agree on what to put there because there were like several committees set up by Finnish Heritage Agency uh, during the 70s and early 80s, but uh, they, they just couldn't like agree on what what kind of exhibition they wanted. So when the museum was closed for renovation, and after that there was only a temporary exhibition like for 10 years. And then the new one opened in 1995. And after that, the, la the latest one, the current one we are talking about in this <clears throat> presentation was opened in 2017. And uh, uh, well, this picture is from the current exhibition and sort of relates to our themes about uh, vibing into the furthest past so that you can touch this uh, Stone Age axe, a corded wear axe. And the Finnish language text says that uh, one of our ancestors uh, made this axe thousands of years ago. But the Swedish and English ones only said that someone made this. So this is an interesting, uh, like, reaching reaching uh, to to the Stone Age with this kind of like ancestral uh, ancestral claim or like language that that evokes a feeling of uh, of touching something that is ours. And the most interesting thing is that this is a corded wear axe, and that is traditionally connected to. Uh, you know, the Indo-European people, mass migrations and uh, stuff like that. So 
traditionally that is not even connected to Finno-Ugric uh, past, but this is like a foreign, foreign object. Um, okay, you can change the slide again. So uh, I looked into into the discussion that there was in 1995 when the uh, previous um, prehistory exhibition was opened, and I found uh, I found out that in in Muinaistutkia, a journal for Finnish archaeologists had a lot of discussion about the 95 uh, exhibition when it was opened and most of the people were not happy happy with it at the time so it was I, I put some like excerpts in here I can just translate some some things from here but like what people hoped for and didn't get with the previous uh, exhibition was that uh, it shouldn't be boring with just uh, artifacts and chronology but it should tell us about what these uh, archaeological finds tell about the life of the pe people and uh, and there should be like all kinds of multi mu multimedia or what, what what words did they use in in the 1990s about these things but that there should be some some like experiences not just uh, boring uh, texts and artifacts <laughs> um, can you put the next excerpt? I, I put them in animation, but um, and this this in this one they complained that I don't think that the credibility of archaeology or scientific scientific aims of the exhibition would be any uh, like lesser if there would be more interpretations and like brave like more brave, braver interpretations about the past that, that we should be, we should be brave enough to tell things even though we are not entirely sure about that because that would, that would make archaeology more interesting. Could you put the next one please? And uh, in this one uh, there was, there was really used words like uninteresting and boring and stuff that if you have like a nice uh, animal, animal shaped stone age axe you should tell about uh, how how this artifact tells about people's uh, creativity and uh, how it connects us to the time thousands of years ago. Um, and the next one, please. So, m what is more important, uh, knowledge or experience? And we should have both of those. Uh, I don't remember if there was any more of these, but try try to click if there was. Okay, this was the last one. Uh, in one of these excerpts, uh, there was also some complaints about the monumentality of the building of the National Museum itself, that it doesn't really, really adjust into modern uh, museum exhibitions because the the venue is so so like constraining that you can't really there is there is only only like that much that you can you can do with that that kind of uh, venue so there were some like uh, hopes for a future exhibition that would only only uh, showcase like some of these very important national objects and uh, then uh, well that there would be only like one one object per room and then then it would it would look more modern and now you can put the next slide I think so I, I noticed that this new exhibition the 2017 exhibition that we are uh, analyzing in this presentation was sort of like an exaggerated answer to all of those uh, problems that that people had with the earlier one that that it should be a memorable experience not something boring. There should be sensory uh, experiences and reconstructions and visualizations of the past to help us connect with it. And we should get rid of the chronological display and somehow set, set the exhibition free from the monumental architecture, restricting it. And then, then I think that people people when designing this new exhibition, people thought that, okay, what kind of methods uh, could be used to 
achieve all this, maybe with folklore. Can you show the next slide, please? Uh, so there is like a long connection between archaeology and folklore as methods of knowing about the past in the uh, antique, well, antiquity, in the Greek scholars um, made, made, the, made the like different between archaeologia or antiquitates and historia so that archaeology or archaeologia uh, included oral tradition as well as material remains of the past and uh, then uh, history approached its sources with more like precise questions and the difference was, was uh, considered to exist not like regarding the source material that much but the methodology so there is much more room for interpretations in archaeologia than historia and then uh, of course, later in antiquarian uh, tradition, um, scholars were I investigating regional pasts and then later in national pasts. And the oral tradition and folklore was collected together with archaeological items. Uh, and then, then later, um, we have this d direct historical method that was uh, it was developed in American archaeology in the United States, where, where like the, the border between historical time and prehistory is, is much closer to modern time. And it was uh, aimed at researching uh, indigenous populations because it was thought that they, their culture hasn't changed at all from like the earliest Stone Age until uh, the time of when the Europeans arrived. So it's sort of a bit of like colonialistic vibe going on in there. But in, the, in this kind of um, direct historical method, you go from what you know to what you don't know and then see how long you can like stretch the analogy from the known. In, in the theory of American archaeology, this is called like flat abor aboriginal time. So nothing could be learned from archaeological data that uh, could not be reached more easily through ethnographic data because they are thought to be culturally so close. So, <clears throat> of course, there are lots of dangers in this kind of analogy because cultural change can happen between the known and the unknown. So if you know something was real in folklore in the 19th century, maybe it wasn't the same thing during the Stone Age. And can you put the next? I think there was another slide. So yeah, I just look for some more theory about this folklore sources. But it's clear that folklore has been used as a like to back up uh, interpretations about prehistory in, in Finnish archaeological proto-archaeology ever since the 18th century. And this, uh, what we have been researching with, with Heidi, uh, these sort of analogies only work if you assume that these people living in the prehistoric times in Finland were like culturally or ethnically in the same continuum uh, to the same people who uh, had Kalevalamentic poetry as their living uh, heritage or oral tradition. So the unknown is like so far away in the prehistory that there will be maybe some problems when when right, trying to combine this kind of methodology. Uh, I think next one is your slide again, Heidi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I will now talk about Kalevala metric oral poetry to give you some context what uh, what we mean by Kalevala metric oral poetry and what uh, the things related to this Kalevala metric poetry in contemporary society how they are uh, displayed in the exhibition that we are talking about. But as you perhaps know, Kalevala metric oral poetry is a form of metered oral poetry in the Baltic Finnic area. And it's 
uh, of course, it's not just Finnish. It's a shared tradition between uh, Finns, Estonians, Karelians, Ingrians, and so on. Uh, it was collected and textualized and archived mainly during the 19th century in Finland as well as in Estonia. And uh, the national epic of Finland, Kalevala, builds on this oral poetry. And it's made by Elias Lönnroth. And of course, Kalevala metric poetry is one of the most cherished symbols of Finnish nationalism. And it's, uh, I don't know if, if you Estonians, how, how you uh, react to this idea, but it's, it's uh, quite common in Finland that uh, people kind of forget that similar kind of poetry exists also in the, Est in the Estonian side, so, or Karelia, or in Ingria. So uh, in Finnish discourses, it's quite common that uh, Kalevala metric poetry is regarded as very Finnish. Uh, I have a map of balto Finnic languages here. As I already mentioned, uh, the transnational traditional uh, culture was practiced in, in, in the area where there are Finnish speakers, Karelian speakers, Ingrian speakers, Baltic speakers, Estonians, Southern Estonian speakers, and so on. And actually, a majority of the archived oral poems were collected from the areas of Karelia and Ingria during the 19th century. Uh, some of the poems, yes, are, are collected from the Finnish side as well. But uh, because of the Refor Reformation, uh, uh, the Kalevala metric poetry has gradually vanished in the Finnish area. So, so uh, when they started to collect the, when the Finnish elite started to collect the oral po poetry, it was uh, mainly alive in Karelian and Ingrian areas. Also in Estonia, but the Finnish collections uh, did not reach to that area. Uh, there are lots of uh, runo song. Uh, or, or Kalevala metric oral poetry materials in Finland. There are hundreds of recordings and the oldest of them uh, are from the beginning of the 20th century. So they are very, very old if you compare it to the global perspective. There are also thousands of manuscripts and, and almost all of these manuscripts are uh, published. They are published in the 35 volume series Suomen kansan vanhat runot, the ancient poems of Finnish people, which is a critical edition of nearly 87,000 texts. Uh, and, and it's today published online uh, on the webpage of Finnish Literature Society. And this series, Suomen kansan vanhat runot, uh, was a huge project. Uh, the first book was published in the beginning of the tw uh, 20th century and the last one was published in 1990s. However, uh, as I and my colleagues argue, today in Finland there is this kind of ideal of so-called Kalevalaicity, which is a fundamental way to understand the Finnish past. And what we mean by this is that uh, people very often refer, uh, re refer to the national epic Kalevala, uh, or Baltic Finnic oral poetry, mythology, and other folkloric themes, narratives, imageries, or elements very vaguely. They not uh, necessarily refer to the verses of the Kalevala, but they kind of refer to this image, the symbols of, of Kalevala, what, what, uh, how, what, that are related to things that images that people understand as Finnish are very ancient. Uh, in this ideal of uh, Kalevalaicity, there is this uh, undertone of mystification. So quite often these uh, references are mystified in a way that some, something uh, that these Kalevala-like images are very old, very ancient, very and very mystic at the same time. And these are also heritageized, uh, by which I mean that uh, when people talk about these uh, these Kalevala-like elements, they often they refer to the past, but they at the same time create uh, understandings of Finnishness. At, in the present, and and they make it uh, make those assertions because of the future. However, uh, as a folklorist, uh, I, I need to stress that there are also 
uh, many co controversial things when people use the Kalevalaik poetry and mythology as an evidence of the Finnish past. And why is that? Uh, one of the reasons is uh, that there are so many temporal layers embedded in the poetry and those layers are multiple and imprecise. When we think about the archived collections in Finland and we have a, the archived traditional poem in front of us, we can of course think about the perspective of settlement history and language history that is somewhat factual knowledge about uh, the history of, that, of, of the Finnish area. But if we think about, uh, if, if we have the poem uh, uh, and, and we think about the relationship between that poem, its verses, its poetic themes, its melodies with which it's sung and mythic images it contains and those uh, the, uh, and the relation to, of those to his, those historical periods, then we cannot say anything factual. Uh, then we have, of course, the context of the collection of the folklore that was that happened mainly during the 19th century, and that's factual knowledge. We can we know a lot of a lot of about the things that. For, ex for instance, the Karelian societies, how they used those, that folk poetry and what it meant for them. Uh, then, if we think about the Kalevalaik poetry, we also, uh, the, one of the tempor temporal layers in the poetry is the ideal of so-called ancientness, muinaisuus in Finnish which is a national romantic construction of the furthest past of Finnishness. And this is not, of course, anything factual, or it's factual when the discourses are factual, but, but the actual temporal layers uh, in this ideal are not that much. And there are also the mythical temporalities in the poems, these kind of intrapoetic themes, uh, poetic and mythic constructions that also have some kind of temporalities inside the poetic world. And that's one of the layers in those poems. And of course, there are also the interpretations in the present that reflect all these layers. So this is a very complex, very complicated thing when we think about the, uh, the Kalevalaik poetry as an evidence of the past. Other problems with this idea is that uh, there is the embedded nationalism that I already talked about. Uh, the exclusion of the transnational movement of the Finnic poetry is a, uh, a fact in, in Finland. Also, uh, these poems are quite often decontextualized, which means that the perspectives and understandings of the mainly Karelian societies that use the poetry become partly erased and partly merged into generalized Finnishness. And uh, lately people have discussed also about the questions of cultural appropriation. Uh, for instance, in Finland there are several Karelian language uh, activists on social media that have questioned the role of the Kalevala and the Kalevala metric poetry as a cornerstone of, of Finnish culture. So there are quite many layers, problematic layers, uh, in, if we think about the collections of oral poetry. And one of the reasons why we see the Kalevalaik images uh, at the National Museum of Finland today is uh, the heritage of comparative folkloristics. Uh, the main character of, of this branch is or was uh, or still is uh, a professor Annalena Siikala, a very brilliant scholar who, who studied the sh uh, shamanism and shamanistic cultures of the North. And she, for, ex for instance, did uh, fieldwork in Siberia. And she wanted to kind of uh, uh, see the similarities, see the comparative perspectives, how, how uh, mythic images move, uh, transnationally and and uh, uh, she also wanted to see how how could the Kalevalai poetry be understood from the perspective of northern shamanism. Uh, one of the problems in in this idea is that the local understandings of the mythology and poetry become somewhat blur blurred 
especially in the popular interpretations. Uh, Anna-Lena Siikala is quite often referred in, in Finnish uh, discourses on shamanism and Kalevalaik poetry, and her research is quite complicated. Uh, people are not familiar with the, uh, with the uh, field of comparative folkloristics, and, and, and they kind of very, uh, that can cause kind of very black and white interpretations about uh, her texts. And I, we argue that uh, we can see Anna-Lena Siegel's ideas also present uh, at the contemporary exhibition of the prehistory. That quite much reflects the views of comparative folkloristics. And this results in generalized representations of the folklore of the area. Uh, we also argue that uh, this kind of mystified atmosphere of uh, Kalevalaicity is brought forth uh, in the ex exhibition because the Kalevala and the mythological characters of the poetry are utilized in many ways and mentioned several times in the exhibition, especially in relation to broad themes such as travel, iron, animals, etc. Lisa. Yes, uh, so it seems that that folklore, uh, like kansanperinne, folk tradition, very as a very broad term, is uh, used in this exhibition and also also otherwise uh, used, maybe often in archaeological uh, literature and maybe especially in museums and this kind of. Uh, uh, things that are aimed at the public, that the folk tradition gives credibility to archaeological interpretations that would uh, somehow maybe lack it otherwise. So uh, if you say something about uh, the beliefs or, or customs or the society of, of a uh, prehistoric um, group of people, for example, the ancient Finns or the Stone Age uh, population of Finland, then you don't uh, have enough uh, proof or have enough like uh, not to interpretive uh, things to just just from the archaeological record. And then then you can say that, well, this similar thing also happens in folklore. And then then it uh, seems somehow like more uh, more credible or more founded in in some something else than just uh, archaeological interpretation. So like I said about the direct historical method and uh, anthropological archaeology, there has been even before that a long tradition of using ethnographic analogies for uh, explaining, for example, stone technology that if we see uh, a tool that is constructed and used similarly amongst uh, contemporary indigenous peoples, then we can say that, okay, because it looks like this <clears throat> stone axe from the Stone Age, we can make an analogy that it, it was used the same way. And in, in this, this Finnish context with the Kalevalai city and uh, ancient uh, Finns and the mythical ancient past, uh, it seems that these folklore analogies are sort of used like that kind of ethnographic analogies as a middle range theory uh, to fill in between, fill in the gaps that are otherwise uh, left if we only try to explain the past through archaeological knowledge. Because we also see in the prehistory exhibition that uh, some things that are so uh, famous archaeological finds or that they, they have so much to uh, much as, as, as just itself, they don't need these uh, like proofs taken from the folklore, but then it has to be something like really special, like for example, the Andrea uh, fish, fishing gear and fish net that is uh, <clears throat> like, like the oldest fishing gear ever found in the world. So <laughs> it doesn't need anything else, just the archaeological interpretation. But especially when it comes to uh, spiritual world or 
what did the people believe in or why did they why did they do these kind of ritual things then then folklore comes in handy go to the next slide just please yes uh, when we went to the uh, exhibition and did some wheel, field work there we uh, noticed that uh, folklore and materiality is intertwined in many ways in the exhibition. So uh, this uh, quite vague refer, uh, references to these folkloric materials are quite often done in the in exhibition by uh, via these kind of interactive tools. And as you probably know, in museum studies, the multi-sensory interaction with, uh, for instance, archaeological artifacts, sites or digital tools has been considered as healing uh, on one hand or as enhancer of the experiences of authenticity, materiality and locality on the other. At the National Museum of Finland Prehistory Exhibition, the digital tools are very much present. Uh, the exhibition includes, for example, multilingual touch screens uh, for exhibition text. There, there is also a touch wall and different kinds of sound and visual effects and videos. Uh, the videos in the exhibition uh, include uh, quite many frosty forested landscapes and wintry scenes. Uh, we argue that the forest in the videos represent, represents uh, multi-temporal connections to the forested past of Finnishness that is very often pictured in the canonical landscape imagery that stems from the, mainly from the 19th century and the hereticized imageries of Finnishness. And these videos at the exhibition, they invite the visitors to immerse into the wintry national landscape that is as we argue simultaneously everywhere and now nowhere in Finland and multi-temporally exist in the past and the present. Uh, we also think that uh, in these videos uh, the ideal of Kalevalaisity is implicitly present. As uh, I have studied the uh, representations of forest in heritageized context and uh, I have argued that forest imageries often represent the mythic and even explicitly the Kalevalaik past of Finnishness in these heritageized contexts, as the idea of forest itself kind of reminds the idea of, of Kalevalaicity as well, because forest is seen as a cradle and as some kind of birthplace of Finnishness, uh, and, and these ideas are commonly cir circulated uh, in the heritageized context that are related to forest, but uh, that are also related to Kalevalaik poetry. The other interesting uh, aspect in the exhibition is the Astuvan Salmi rock painting. Uh, it is exhibited in the exhibition uh, through a huge interactive touch wall that includes a replica of the Astuvan Salmi rock paintings. Then those rock paintings are located in uh, southeastern Finland. Uh, these rock paintings very likely do not stem from the culture of groups using the Proto-Finnish language as, as uh, those uh, people who, who spoke Proto-Finnish language probably came to the area uh, in the beginning of the Iron Age. Uh, the rock painters uh, very likely came from groups that were related to people that today are understood as the indigenous Sami people. And it's very interesting that the Sami perspectives and Sami uh, folklore are acknowledged in Finnish archaeological studies very much, but not in the exhibition. On the touch wall, there is a, a text that declares that touching a rock painting was a way to get in contact with the spirit world. And the spirit world thus becomes because the Sami folklore is not mentioned, but the Kalevalaik understandings, the Kalevala and the mythological heroes of the Kalevala are mentioned other, in other parts of the, of the uh, exhibition. 
uh, so the spirit world kind of is uh, connects to those other uh, folkloric elements that are on display. And uh, the spirit wo world simultaneously becomes a shared mythological world of the northern people in which ethnicities, ownerships and localities uh, are merge merged into a bigger entity. Can I just add about the... <clears throat> yes. Uh, yeah, about the proto-Finnic people and then, then the Sami that we don't have we don't have archaeological evidence of the ethnicity of the people during the prehistory. We, we, we can't say that Finns came into Finland at some point like we used to, but we don't, we don't say that anymore because there is no evidence. But we, what we do have is the linguistic evidence about what kind of languages there have been spoken in the area of Finland. And then we can say that it's more likely that the people who painted, uh, painted those actually sp spoke a language that wasn't uh, not Sami or Finnish because finno ugric languages only came to the area of Finland later. Yeah, and it's of course very very hard to that the, the relations between materiality, archaeological artifacts, ethnicities, and and languages, cultures are of course very complicated things, and 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 there are it's very hard to say anything about that, but. Uh, the Kalevala metric mythology and Kalevala metric poetry is very much related to language, as Lisa just mentioned. And uh, we know from linguistic studies that uh, the, the speakers of, of Finnic languages uh, are somewhat newer in the area than, than the rock paintings. Uh, here is a video taken from uh, the exhibition and in this video we touch the interactive wall. There you go. Uh, we have a question for you uh, for the discussion and we would like to discuss that how or does this digital effect interconnect the visitor or the toucher and the materiality of the rock painting and the immateriality of the shared spirit world and if it does, how? I think that would be a very interesting thing to discuss in our uh, discussion today. But now to provide you some concluding remarks, uh, we argue that the incorporation of folkloric elements into this exhibition uh, that displays huge time spans is somewhat problematic because uh, it results in generalized understandings of folklore and also ignores the problematic temporal layers I, I uh, introduced you earlier in this presentation in the archived folklore materials. And thus the folkloric knowledge and materials become elements through which the visitor can wipe to the furthest past. Lisa, would you like to add something? Uh, well, not much, but maybe that it is easy to understand why, why it, it, would be, it would feel tempting to use folkloric elements or, for example, about the rock painting, that that it's tempting to see that we all share some kind of like you know common uh, childhood of uh, humans in the Stone Age, and uh, touching this kind of mystic painting uh, feel, feels feels like the same for all of us. But can we <laughs> can we interpret it uh, like through a fol folklore that is collected much later and doesn't really relate to that kind of society that painted these rock paintings. But thank you. Thank you very much. If you are interested in the sources or the literature we used in this uh, presentation, please contact us, us. Thank you very much. I, now we have some 30 minutes for the discussion. Tenno, please.
Firstly, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, now we have uh, up to 30 minutes for discussion. Uh, uh, those who are in here in uh, offline, you, uh, you, uh, your questions are welcome, but uh, also people uh, in teams can participate and ask. Uh, so, um, yeah, Ainti, yeah. please. Uh, thank you for yeah. your presentation. It was uh, really captivating, and uh, I last visited uh, the fin Finnish uh, National Museum also like not not too long ago. So uh, the exhibition itself was also very um, like uh, fascinating, and and uh, I was really uh, really uh, like baffled to to meet the archaeological objects that I had only met in the literature, but like. <laughs> The, the real things uh, just lie there and and uh, where they're like physically. Uh, so uh, I don't remember much about the digital uh, solutions mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, the, the actual real things are the most important. But uh, the first question that uh, came to my mind was uh, when you mentioned about the practice that when Finland was part of the Swedish kingdom uh, up until the 1809, I believe, yeah, uh, then uh, uh, the, this um, prehistoric findings were brought to Stockholm. But uh, as like, I know that um, nowadays it's a tendency, um, not only in Finland, but also uh, in Sweden and Nor Norway to uh, uh, bring Mm, objects uh, of uh, Sami heritage that are like placed in everywhere outside the Sami uh, region that uh, they are like uh, gathering those like back to where they should belong and my question is that uh, is uh, there some kind of like um, similar tendency in Finland that uh, the things that are were brought to Stockholm mm -hmm. are like uh, brought back to Finland Helsing or elsewhere. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Lisa, did you hear this question? Yes. Yes, yes I heard it. Well, well, no, no, there hasn't been any, any repatriations uh, from Sweden to Finland. But it's, it's more like, it wasn't like that kind of colonialistic uh, thing. It was just like legislation that already in the Middle Ages, uh, there was a law in Sweden that... Uh, ancient artifacts that are found from the ground belong to the, to the king. And uh, it was just enhanced in, in the 18th century legislature. So there hasn't been any talk about that. <laughs> there is actually this one very famous golden uh, Iron Age, uh, like bracelet or like a neck, 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 what, what do you call it? Like a necklace. jewelry. Yeah. Necklace, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was that was found in Finland in the late 18th century, and it has been in Stockholm ever since. But uh, currently, it is uh, loaned, uh, borrowed to the National Museum of Finland for this prehistory exhibition. But yeah, <laughs> there hasn't been any repatriations from Sweden. Yeah, and of course there have been repatriations in Finland because uh, some of the Sami collections yes. have been repatriated to the um, Sami community. Thank you. I also have a question. Like, uh, uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, in curating the current, uh, the, uh, current exhibition, yeah, yeah, I'm wondering that uh, curating the current uh, exhibition, how much did uh, the museum collaborate with archaeologists from university, for example, because like in our exhibition, we have uh, collaborated with very many different researchers, also archaeologists, and uh, so how how is the case in fin Finland? Yeah, I I think the National Museum of Finland uh, communicated with archaeologists a lot, not folklorists. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you think, Lisa? 
Yeah, the exhibition, like manuscript, was written by two archaeologists, uh, mm. Professor Vesa-Pekka Herva from the University of Oulu and University Lecturer Antti Lahelma from the University of Helsinki. And then they also collaborated with the archaeologists working at the Finnish Heritage Agency. But still, the like the visual display and the the uh, like everything that how how does it look at what kind of things are like put forth and so on. It was dis- decided by uh, this like designing agency uh, from outside of the museum to so yeah there was archaeological knowledge used but but all of it didn't make it to the final display as it was uh, intended in the manuscript maybe i actually have a, I have a follow-up question like uh, <clears throat> uh, as, as i see it as i see our exhibition i think that uh, uh, our ex- exhibits kind of try to capture also the archaeological context. I think, like quite, quite, quite much. Like Ainti, who <laughs> my co- colleague Ainti is also archaeologist, so so Ainti definitely can, you know, um, can uh, add 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 some something more to this. But but I, I have feeling that like we in our exhibition the archaeological context is also uh, also uh, very important uh, and and uh, also to show the way we maybe find archaeological findings so open up also this uh, this uh, mm-hmm. like scientific uh, the production of scientific knowledge in, in this sense but maybe Ainti, maybe you can add something <laughs> uh, yes well uh of course, uh, the context of uh, where the object lied and how it was found, uh, they both are very important. And in some cases, when the archaeological uh, objects like made some time in the prehistory, uh, they have been found and they have been reused in the more uh, recent past, like in the 19th century or uh, maybe or so. So like this is also... Um, emphasized in at least in our museum so it shows kind of like several lifetimes of the of a single object if this is what you uh, had in mind uh, yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah I, I think lisa can add if you have something to say about this but i i think that uh, as lisa told us the discussions uh before the opening of this contemporary exhibition kind of discussed that that the bo- exhibition shouldn't be too boring and perhaps uh, those uh, kind of ar- archaeological methods were labeled as <laughs> too boring <laughs> yeah. yeah it seems that there is not much about the formation of archaeological knowledge or or <laughs> about the methods of archaeology in the exhibition there are some some like some things about the context of the finds and of course and like finding uh, spots for them and uh, uh, I, I I only remember this one funny story that was in the exhibition about this very strange looking uh, like huge uh, jewelry from from Iron Age and uh, it, it was said that the finder had thought that it was some sort of part fallen from a Soviet aeroplane, but <laughs> <laughs> it was actually an Iron Age, uh, like, br- brood. <laughs> so there are some of those kind of, like, uh, stories about finding those, but, but not that much. <laughs> I have one more question, um, like, without any doubt, uh, Kalevala narrative, so to say, is a, a very iconic uh, kind of like um, source to, to understand uh, the past mm-hmm. for, for many people uh, in Finland, as it is uh, for Estonians who think of the Finnish past, uh, then Kalevala comes to our minds. Uh, but are there like uh, some other sources, I don't know, some like medieval uh, texts maybe that, or, or something else that can at least partially compete with this like dominant iconic text? Well, that's a very good question and I think one of the uh, 
symbols or, or things in the past that can compete with uh, the Kalevalaik past is the narrative of the Second World War in Finland. That's the other one. But when we discuss about things like the, the furthest past, then we of course cannot utilize the narratives of the Second World War. So uh, so that's why when people, uh, the, the kind of the idea of Kalevalaicity or the Kalevalaik past, it's, it's so dominant. It, it become uh, like it was the central thing in building the Finnish nation in the 19th century. So the, the, the Finnish nationalism during the 19th century did not at first uh, aim at, at uh, an independent nation state, but it was kind of this cultural nationalistic movement first that uh, tried to create a history for a nation that didn't have one, that was had always been, you know, uh, part of the first part of the Swedish Empire, then part of the Russian Empire. So this was a huge, huge project during the 19th century. So that's why the <clears throat> narrative is still going so strong in the contemporary in contemporary Finland. Yeah, and even though there are like medieval sources and uh, stuff like that, it doesn't really help into into this this problem that they had that they want they were very patriotic and they wanted to wanted something something to reach the culture that what were the Finnish people uh, doing like before the Swedish came to rule us and before uh, we were Christians so, so that's that's like the the thing that they were trying to reach by using Kalevala as a as a source historical source which is really interesting because in Estonia um, we have a lot of uh, folk uh, songs, but uh, uh, for creating this national past, uh, they haven't been uh, uh, exploited that much. Mm -hmm. uh, in comparison, we have a medieval chronicle uh, from the yeah. uh, early 13th century, mm -hmm. a chronicle of Henry, uh, which uh, has been used in a, like, in a similar way, that the like, uh, whole national romantic uh, this, um, mythology, so to say, or like myth. Yeah. Is uh, what was created uh, even as early as the 19th century. That, like before the conquest, we were strong and powerful and glorious, <laughs> and uh, and also like um, similarly, it was like overused or this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that it it became um, really difficult to uh, to distinguish the the, the facts and the, the the very kind of like um, biased interpretation. Yeah, that is so interesting. And I think that one of the main reasons for this is that, that uh, in the, Esto the Estonian area has been in contact with the European liter literal culture for so long. And then it's kind of a different kind of situation in the area, like the mainland Europe than in, in Finland, where it has been a quite remote place <laughs> for <laughs> Almost. Uh, yeah, always. and we don't have any like clear. Yeah. We don't have any like clear date for for you know conquest or or the, our our like living together with the Swedish just uh, fades into the ancient times like without any written sources. We can't say like uh, for certainty that how long uh, has the Swedish like the Swedish speaking Finns the Swedish speaking community lived on the shores of Finland. So. Uh, it goes like further back than than just uh, like forming administration together with the Swedish. So it's sort yeah. of like vague. How, it, we we try we try to make that kind of history like during the late 19th century that we had crusades and the Swedish came and it was brutal conquest. But then now we know that it didn't go like that. <laughs> we just yeah. like sort of started to be together with the Swedish and we can't say when it started. Yeah, and actually during the 19th century, the folklorists, uh, there were debates about uh, are, the, uh, his, are the events described in Kalevala metric poems, are they historical or mythical? So are they kind of telling something about real things, real events of the past? Of the past? So uh, that was a real debate during the 19th century in Finland. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. No. 
Uh, I have a question about uh, visitors today, how they perceive it and how they you know, relate to it and uh, do you know what they think? Mm. We haven't done any research on, on other visitors just than us and we are not authentic visitors at all because we are, <laughs> we are researchers. So it would be very interesting to hear the visitor perspective. But Lisa has been a, a museum guide at the National Museum of Finland, so you can perhaps something add something to this. <laughs> yeah, well, not not during this uh, this this exhibition, but uh, I have heard I have heard like something that most people have have been positive about this uh, prehistory exhibition that people like it. So most of the complaints I have heard are from archaeologists and <laughs> because there is always something wrong, you know, with the text or something. But yeah. uh, overall, I think that the public has, has welcomed it very well, that they like like these uh, touchy, touchy, feely things and, uh, and how it looks like and so on. But we haven't done any research on that or, or haven't seen any official hmm. like feedback that museum has been collecting. Yeah. So there is no research on, on the exhibition yet, uh, despite Lisa's uh, study, studies. Uh, I have a... hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have another question. It's uh, maybe it uh, addressed to Lisa. Uh, what uh, she uh, when Lisa described the uh, discussion about uh, presentation of. Uh, past or the prehistory in the museum and the um, critic towards uh, towards it that, that it shouldn't be you know uh, uh, boring and so on and so forth I was thinking that does it align uh, with the uh, archaeological or, or the science of ar archaeology and uh, different trends in archaeology you know, like interpretive archaeology or mm -hmm. like uh, other uh, trends. Th does it has uh, any like? Uh, uh, does it align with with uh, archaeology as a uh, science? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, maybe the '95 exhibition was thought to be old-fashioned already when it was opened because it, because it took them so long to get it open, so it was already like. Uh, old-fashioned and <laughs> boring when it was opened but yeah of course maybe maybe like this kind of post-processual or post-post-processual archaeology focusing uh, more on past identities and uh, uh, like the spiritual side of people's lives and individuals and uh, the diversity of the past maybe maybe it's it's like in line with with the exhibition as it is now, not that much just uh, artifacts on glass uh, cases uh, in chronological order, but uh, trying to reach uh, something about the experience of people in the past, how they lived. And it's very interesting that at the same time in Finnish folkloristics, the uh, perspective of comparative uh, fol folkloristic was, of course, uh, it was very prominent in many many ways in the 1990s, but after that, uh, it kind of gradually have va vanished somehow. It more people have studied more uh, like uh, contextual things, like uh, people have studied the Karelian societies during the 19th century that used the oral poetry, and they have not kind of tried to create these kind of huge time spans or, or huge kind of ideas about how how uh, folklore have moved through the Baltofinic area or something like that. So, so it's it's very interesting that there are kind of very different kinds of things going on in different disciplines. Yeah, well, now with the ancient DNA uh, stuff, we are we are back into big questions of migrations and uh, big cultural changes in archaeology. Mm, and as Again. well, yeah, yeah, that's that's one thing. And I think also in folklore studies, the current trend of uh, post-humanism is going to going to influence uh, the field in a way that 
that you know lo localities are perhaps not in the center or these kind of critical ideas about uh, identities or nationalism all these kinds of things are not in the center perhaps but but these kind of more post-humanistic kind of ideas about folklore how the, what different kinds of agencies post-human agencies there are uh, these kinds of things One thing I also was thinking about is that, like, when <clears throat> when you present uh, like prehistory as as you know one period of time, then it's it, it might be quite too easy to uh, to present like it as one narrative or as one coherent uh, period in a way, like. Uh, uh, like some archaeologists uh, uh, are arguing that, uh, for example, in Estonian case, when we think about Estonian folk religion, that this is like we have some prehistoric folk religion, like, and it's like uh, uh, very similar, like in uh, different areas in Estonia, but actually, and uh, it's it spans over very long period of time, but actually, it's not. It's like we have had like we can uh, say that we have like uh, m we have had many different uh, religions uh, in Estonia even in in uh, prehistoric uh, period so so maybe it's the kind of the same problem with with uh, prehistory that it's uh, the, it's changing and but mm. yeah yeah i think it, that's always a problem with these kinds of displaced that uh, you need to create a construct of, of something so like and and in truth I think that uh, different kinds of uh, for instance different kind of religions or different kind of materialities different kind of ethnicities and languages can coexist mm -hmm. so that's uh, uh, one problem and also different kind of temporalities can coexist as as we try to uh, tell in our presentation that uh, there is the kind of exact uh, time spans of, of archaeology that, uh, the, that the scientific methods can provide. And then there are also these other kinds of temporalities, such as the Kalevala metric poetry that I introduced. And there are also, uh, in relation to uh, those archaeological artifacts, there are different kinds of temporalities, as you mentioned here, that, that there can be kind of afterlives of those archaeological art artifacts and everything. So these are quite quite complicated things and it's very hard to display <laughs> what do you think lisa yeah the past diversity can be can be hard to hard to reach like during the thousands of years of stone age there was uh, of course like a lot of uh diversity in not just temporal but also in geographically if we think of the whole area of finland we can only say something uh, based on the archaeological material, but we can't reach reach the whole thing, like in in not not in any way. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, what I began to think right now is that uh, we must uh, maybe like take in in our minds, like or like take into consideration what the like re why the regular people so to say like not n non professionals in this sense why for them history or the past is important after all like why mm. do they want to know about it uh, do they want to know like what exactly happened is it uh, important for them because it uh, gives them kind of like sense of belonging mm. uh, uh, is it uh, because they want this kind of like a beautiful mythical time when everything was uh, right, correct, <laughs> mm. <laughs> no problems or, or so? Like, um, and and when they come to the museum, they kind of like are looking for this, these uh, like uh, answers to these questions, and uh, then they have some kind of like expectations that they they want to. Um, 
get the, the answer as, as short as possible, maybe even in one sentence or so. And uh, simply to say that things indeed are complicated uh, does not, um, is, isn't enough for them. <laughs> and then the, the curators of the museums and uh, the researchers um, have a hard time to like yeah. meet the, the, the needs of the audience. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good notion. And I, I think uh, uh, Laura Jane Smith in the field of heritage studies kind of replies to this very well that, that uh, she has studied different kinds of museums in, in many parts of the world. And, and she says that whatever the curators <laughs> kind of try to do or <laughs> try to educate uh, people, however, come to museum and they have the different kinds of ideas about the past in, in their minds. And they come to the museum and they still are like, oh, this reinforces the things I, I already thought about the past, whatever the curators wanted to say. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Yeah, and, and I understand very well that it's, it's a kind of even a stupid way to say that the past was complicated, you know, <laughs> that the people are very un unhappy with that kind of <laughs> ideas always. And the past is used for constructing identities. Mm. And that's why we need this uh, stone axis with the caption that one of our ancestors made this uh, thousands of years ago, <laughs> because it helps people to connect to the past. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Mm -hmm. yes, and like maybe we also need like narratives, like core narratives for constructing the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I thank you very much for for coming for for this very yeah, fascinating presentation and also for this very inspiring uh, discussion. So, 